We're being recorded. What's going on, guys? So, welcome back to another Gutter Fighting Secrets Tactical Podcast. This is going to be a special edition with our lead tactical liaison, DJ. As you guys know, DJ has been a private security contractor for a long while, ever since he got out of the Army, uh, doing, obviously, overseas work in the U.S. military. He's a combat veteran, Iraq combat veteran. Ever since then, he's been traveling the world doing executive close protection Right now, he works for another company that will remain unnamed as an individual protection specialist. So DJ's agreed to come on and break it down for us. How do guys get involved with the private security industry, with the overseas contracting, with the uh, you know mercenary gigs, if you will? It's a little bit different than that, but I get a lot of questions. So I figured let's bring on DJ who can answer these questions honestly a lot better than i ever could so bro welcome on to the podcast what's up third round here we go it's good <laughs> to be on again man it's good to have you back on man so i can't tell you how often i get dm'd on instagram or emailed or even just in the comments guys are asking me hey how do i get involved with security contracting i want to go to iraq i want to go to you know africa and freaking do the cool guy gig where i put on some plates and hold an ar and a pair of sick, you know, Oakley sunglasses and do the whole spiel. And I'm always telling them, look, it's complex. You got to know people, this and that, but man, you could tell them so much more than me. So let's break it down for these guys, EJ. How do guys get involved with private security industry? Yeah. And, and that's, I hear that a lot too. So, um, kind of to start off, um, things are way different than they were even 10 years ago. And uh, you and I both know that intimately, um, especially in the last five years, um, private security companies, in a sense, the ones that have contracts to the Department of Defense, the State Department, the federal government in general, uh, stateside and abroad, or, or we say OCONUS outside the continental United States, they've become increasingly more and more corporatized, consolidated, corporatized. Um, some of them are, you know, on the stock market and things like that. So it's not necessarily how it was in this, in this game as it was even, you know, 10 years ago, eight years ago, whatever it was. So, um, that's something that people need to, uh, to really understand, um, because the requirements for getting into the job are starkly more strict than they were back in, back in the day. Back in the even the you know the early two thousands when I was still in the army and we had you know we were working with Blackwater and Triple Canopy and Armor Group and all those guys, so uh, things have changed dynamically across the board in that regard and in very big ways. So we'll kind of we'll kind of go from the get go here. <clears throat> so you've got your your corporatized your private security companies, uh, major companies. So G four S. Uh, Garter World Federal Services, Constellus Group, SOC, PAE, DynCorp, VAE Systems, you know, and the list goes on and on. So those are some of the largest ones um, that are U.S. based. Um, G4S uh, bought uh, Armor Group, actually, um, which is a British uh, defense contractor. Um, so it, it's, it's corporate, corporatized companies. Um, when people say mercenary, uh, a private security contractor is not a mercenary. A mercenary is somebody who goes and, you know, is, is working for a foreign government most of the time. They, they really, as far as in any business related aspect, they're not representing the United States per se. They're a hired gun. They're a fighter going to a foreign country to work for that country or work for an entity. Um, the cartels have mercenaries, uh, Dash, ISIS, they have mercenaries, they have foreign fighters that come in, um, <clears throat> just as much as foreign governments recruit and hire uh, actual mercenaries, uh, individuals to do, uh, to do work for them and are paid by them, not affiliated with our government at all. That's a big difference. Private security companies, I mean, it, American private security companies are based in the U.S., they contract to the American government um, or a coalition government that's approved by uh, business relations and, and business law. So, you know, for the for the British or a coalition partner or somebody that we're, we're assisting in some way or another, 
um, Haiti, for example, uh, after the hurricane um, and, and things like that. So, but it, it is private security companies work for or contract to the government and private clients that are U.S. based for the most part. Um, there are some exceptions to, to small scale contracts other than that. Um, say for shipping companies, for example, and things like that, you'll have some groups like Trident Group that might have some boats that are flagged out of Panama, which has a, a close relation to the United States. So there, there are some of those nuanced exceptions or uh, additions to that, but that's otherwise it's, that's, that's how they work. And then from there you have volunteers, which are people that go to foreign countries to fight, work with the Kurds or the YPG and all that. They're not getting paid for it though. Sometimes the Kurds might be able to give them a little bit of money, but most of the time they're going on their own volition. And most of the time they're spending a lot of money to even go do that and, and just fight to fight and to help those people. So that's a big difference there too. Volunteers are not security contractors, even if they have a military background. Um, so going from there, um, the hiring process, and, and this is the, the, the big, the big question for everyone is how do I get into this? Uh, get into this industry? How do I get onto a contract and go overseas and do this and, the, and that and everything? So nowadays anymore, and again, this, is, this applies to really the last five to eight years when the major corporatization structure started to really expand and kind of stranglehold onto security companies. Um, <clears throat> requirements in your background, you almost exclusively have to be former military or law enforcement. Now um, you can go get a bunch of training from outside companies like CRI or ESI. And unless those training companies in particular have connections to uh, companies that, that are contractors that you can apply to and stuff, and they might help you with that or a company that specifically recognizes that training certificate, that training doesn't mean anything. You can't do anything with it in the industry anymore. So you need to you need to go join the military, serve two years in the military minimum, or go serve in law enforcement, like on a SWAT team or an SRT kind of special unit team. Um, I mean, you could do it. A, you could apply as a as a normal patrol officer too um, after uh, about five years of service. Um, so that's that's a, a real big change in requirement. And you should be looking at all these companies. They have their job listings publicly open on, on websites, whether it's their integral website or Indeed or Glassdoor or whatever, you can go look on there and they're going to have the list of requirements, what they want <clears throat> from a person uh, experience and work background wise to what they will accept for an application. Um, so you really have to have that experience, the military and law enforcement experience there's a couple of guys that are former like firefighters and EMTs that can get into the game too. Um, some other federal service, you know, agents, agencies, uh, marshals, things like that, that'll, that can get you into it too. But across the board though, it's going to be military and law enforcement background, um, a minimum of two years in either of them. Um, so then from there, um, let's see, I got my notes written down here. So some of the discrepancies with that, again, you know, uh, corporate, corporate companies, um, you know, you have some independent, more independent uh, security contracting companies. Um, a lot of them are like, you know, they, they dabble in both like private investigation and private security, real small scale stuff. Um, some is fringe work. Um, and then you can do it as an independent contractor, too. And that's where you need to you need to be able to network and, and have to know people like what I was doing for a time as an independent contractor, I didn't have HR or anyone, you know, it was just me, you know, using my skills and a, a little bit of licensing going in and making some connections and networking with some people and, you know, finally getting in touch with uh, this holdings group or this insurance group or whatever that, that, you know, is uh, working with a, a company and they need some executive protected when they go to a meeting in, you know, Mexico or Honduras or something, you know, and that's, and that's how that ends up working. And I talked about that in the, in the first podcast that we ever did together, um, just some of the background with that, but um, that's much more fringe. And even then some of that work experience, unfortunately, because of the corporatization structure now with these major security companies, 
they won't recognize it. They're going to, they, they keep asking for, you know, verification of employment and blah, blah, blah. It's like, you're an independent contractor getting paid in cash half the time, more than half the time. You know, it's very hard to verify that kind of employment, even though you've been doing it, you know, and you have years and years doing it. You know, um, you can have as many letters of recommendation as you want and references, um, which myself in particular, you know, I have plenty of those too. Um, but unfortunately, these, these faceless corporations, and that's what they are now, they don't care about that. They want, they want to see veritable work experience, um, a, a applicable background um, and documentation to support that. So that's where the military and law enforcement stuff comes into play. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's see. On are the days where it was, you know, 2003, guys were making up their resume, claiming yep. that they were in this unit or that unit. Nobody did any background checks. They show up in Iraq and can't even freaking, you know, clear malfunction in an AR or AK, right? There, there was that going <laughs> yeah. on, but not and, anymore. And they, they, I think that's part of the reason now that they want veritable work experience, right? Yes, um, to, to an extent, definitely. Yeah, when, when I was in the Army still and, you know, we had some of the Blackwater Triple Canopy and Armor Group guys and stuff that were rolling around with us, you know, some were, were definitely legit and had some serious background. I mean, look at Travis Haley and stuff. Yeah. Um, but then you had some guys that had been just bouncers, doormen at a bar before, you know, they ended up kind of networking with some people, uh, you know, like it used to be. And they went, hey, we got this job. If you're interested, you can make 100 grand, but you got to go to Iraq. And they're like, hell yeah, I'll do it. <clears throat> and then they get kind of up trained and then they go. Um, very cowboy in that aspect back in the day, which that's OK. You know, that's that's opportunity. And that's where if you do a lot of outside, if you were doing a lot of outside training with training companies, but you didn't have a military background, it didn't matter. You had all that training. Yeah. You could actually apply and, and get picked up to do it then. Um, and that's something that's huge. That's changed now, um, apart from stricter clamping down by the government on the vetting process and, and mandated background checks and everything. And then the company side of it with requirements and, and everything whether it's job listings or in your work background or just their background checks. Now, and, what uh, about speaking of background checks, security clearances, are they yeah. required for these positions? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So especially overseas, you 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 end up getting a secret top secret clearance. Um, here stateside with some of these gigs, you know, you're getting public trust and top secret clearances. Yeah. Um, so that vetting process to get those clearances is very strict. Um, you have to go through uh FBI background check for one. That's that's the first step. And then uh, you go through a, a, a federal background checking system called Equip, um, which is a, a lengthy informational uh, process. They want the last seven years of financials, your residence history, blah, 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 blah. Because they want to know they want to know that you don't have a lot of debt or bankruptcy and stuff, too. You know that you can't be bribed and bought, you know, in cases of espionage and other things. Um, as one example, that's why they're so heavy on the background checks now. And then apart from the FBI and EQIP, you know, then you have agency specific background checks and, and they can determine at any time, like if they don't like something in your background, they'll just, they'll just boot you. Yeah. And the company lets you go. Most of these companies on top of being corporations are at will employers. They can fire you whenever they want for mm -hmm. next to no reason. So that, that's something you need to take into consideration too, everyone listening. Um, so FEI, FRI background check, e equip, agency specific background checks, and then the time frame for that. Company uh, company level background checks, um, and then the FBI background checks usually come back within a week or two. Um, equip can come back as quick as two weeks. Some of the more agency specific and intensive background checks, especially for the State Department, it can take up to five hundred and thirty days. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's over. That's just about two years, just over two, right at two years, um, or just just a little under. Um, that's a long time to be in that in that waiting process, you know. And part of that is the government's just backed up on background checking people yeah. as is. But that's how intensive that the background check is now. You know, you're getting fingerprinted and everything. Practically, got to give them your kidney. You know, it's uh, it's pretty it's pretty wild. So um, <laughs> there's a lot that goes into that. Um, 
and a lot that they require of you now. So again, you got to look at job requirements on top of understanding there's going to be a long process for you to even get onto a contract after a company hires you on. Yeah. Um, the contract that I'm in right now, um, once I got back from doing uh, independent contracting and some overseas stuff, when I got to with this company and the contract that I'm on now domestically, um, so I got hired in in February of 2019, and I wasn't starting on contract on sites until April. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it took it took uh, between training, the initial training, and then background checks, and then you have to do. Uh, for this contract with uh, the, the agencies that we contract to, you have to take a test hmm. and uh, you have to pass that test. And then you're waiting for background checks. My background checks came back in two weeks because I'm squeaky clean, but um, some dudes were waiting a year yeah. um, just because they have one little thing in their background. So. Yeah. yeah. And then sometimes they'll give you an interim clearance, you know, and you can work in the meantime, but then yep. if, if they decide later, like, Oh, Nope, sorry. Then that's it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You get, you get a, you, you get a temporary uh, either public trust or secret level clearance and it's, it is, it's temporary. And that's usually up to 90 days. Um, kind of the same as the probationary period when you're hired on, um, which is at a lower pay grade than what you, what you will be at eventually. Um, you're kind of in a probationary period there. You're kind of in limbo, you're working, but you're in limbo. Yep. Um, and you, you just, you have to mind your P's and Q's and be on your A game. And uh, just, you know, have a, have a good record. So um, a lot of people get through it, no problem. And then sometimes, sometimes even two years down the line, you've been working on contract. And then all of a sudden, the agency wants to change their mind because they don't like something in your background. Yep. And, the, and they'll boot you. And that happened, to a, that happened to one of our guys not that long ago. Um, and it was like, fucking seriously, dude? Um, that's it's amazing with all these background checks. Uh you know, even look, even in the civil service, man, firefighting stuff, it, yeah. it, it's almost like they use it as an excuse not to hire a guy sometimes or just to get rid of a guy sometimes. And it's not yeah. right, you know? Yeah, no, I agree. It's not it's not right. You know, and, and, and much like much like uh, the fire and police services and everything, you know, private security companies, um, not the companies themselves, but there's there's unions, workers unions for. Uh, private security personnel as well, mm -hmm. just apart from law enforcement and, and firefighters. So there's unions too. So you would think that the unions would be offering a little bit of support and, and help and keep helping you, you know, protect it, secure your job, but they don't, Yeah, they don't, they don't do really anything. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a very dog eat dog world. It's very, it's very difficult and cruel when it comes to that kind of thing. And, and especially the more and more these companies corporatize and the more picky the government becomes. So that's something that people really have to understand. It is, it is not like it used to be at all. <laughs> Even when I was in that world, man, it was tough to get a position unless you were a tier one type of guy, right? Like, or unless you had been in it already. Like if you got in 2004, 2005, great. You're already in it. You've already made the connections. You've already had the work experience, whatever. But uh, if you were getting in later than that, you know, certainly post 08, 09, later than that, it, uh, it's just been getting harder. And that's why I'm glad we got you on here, man, to tell guys like, look, nowadays is not like the old cowboy days. It's changed and it's only going to keep changing. Absolutely. Yeah, no, yeah. And we've got a couple of guys that are tenured like that. You know, they were working for Olive Group back in the day or whatever. You know, they're a little tenured, so they're able to stay with the company and stay on contract. But yeah, no, it's. It has begun. It became insanely difficult um, with all the just the just the hoops that you have to jump through, uh, yeah. apart from requirements and stuff. So yeah, no, it's yeah, it's nothing like it was. So when guys do get hired, uh, let's say you're lucky enough to have made it through. Maybe you, you know, like I always tell guys, look, learn another language, get your EMT, do those two things. It'll it'll give you a leg up, right? So let's say guys did something like that, or they were in the military before. They were lucky enough to get hired. What can you expect after getting hired going forward? Is there a training period that you do, like you said, with a probationary period? What what is it? Okay, yeah, yeah. So um, once once you've been officially hired on, um, there's a short waiting period. You start doing some of your background check stuff in that process, and then you'll start training for uh, PSO, uh, Protective Security Officer, and PSS, Protective Security Specialist. Um, 
So if we're, uh, you, you would start training just shortly after being hired before any getting on any job or any contract, it's paid training, which is nice. Um, so for a PSO, uh, it's about three weeks of training. That first week is use of force training and firearm training, almost, you know, just explicitly it's, it's that. And then after that, um, it's two weeks of training uh, in, you know, state law, uh, federal law, policy, what you can enforce, what you can't enforce, further use of force stuff, you know, when it involves like non-lethal stuff or baton, stuff like that, you know, you go through all that. And then after that three weeks of training, you take a test for the agency or agencies um, and then you have to pass that test and then you can start on contract and you'll start working after issuance of your equipment and everything. Um, for PSS is going overseas um, and it depends on the company, but it averages about 45 days of training. So um, you'll kind of do an induction, uh, kind of an induct period for like a day or two, start getting familiarized and everything. You'll go over company policies and stuff and you'll start training. You'll do weapon stuff. You'll do driving stuff. You'll do um, uh, uh, close protection related stuff, executive protection related stuff for like PSD, private security detail stuff, um, you know, formations for, you know, protected people and all that. Um, and now they have it in training because of Benghazi, you, you know, you navigate through like a smoke filled multi-room kind of like building and stuff. You have to navigate through smoke and all that. Um, so you do a lot of that training and a lot of stuff like that. And then there's some, some legal briefs and things like that, that you have to do as well as, uh, you know, uh, other things that have to do like culturally and legally with the country that you're going to, you know, um, things like, Hey, don't go out of the green zone after dark, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, so that, that's, that's kind of how it, uh, that's, that's kind of how it goes. So there's a lot of, um, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of facets to it. There's a lot of steps. Uh, the PSO the PSO route, um, and that's for domestic contracts and and some overseas stuff. Um, it it's a little bit easier to get in that route, and then work your way up to transferring to a PSS position, particularly for overseas. Um, and usually they want you to do about a year with the company in a PSO position, and then transition to a PSS position. Again, this is something far different from how it used to be. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of one thing. Um, what, what else? Uh, and I had talked about pay a little bit, so paid training. And then, so then once you're on contract, you have a 90 day probationary period where you're kind of at a, at a lower pay rate for those 90 days. And then as long as everything's good and you, you finish that probationary period, you'll get bumped up to what your pay is going to be for the entire time that you're with the company, basically. Uh, unless you're fortunate enough to be able to move into a higher, higher position, administrative or otherwise, or whatever, you know, for, for more pay. Um, some of the issues with pay nowadays, private security contractors, PSOs and PSSs, who I talk about in particular, because that's just, that's the realm that I'm most familiar with and, and, and uh, certified and educated in. PSOs and PSSs today are being paid less than they ever have been when it comes to during a conflict period like this and things like that. So the money that the, that, you know, Blackwater guys, Drupal Canopy guys and everything that we're getting KBR and Halliburton and all that they were making off the military, the DOD and the state department in the early mid two thousands, you know, six figure salaries making 120 K 150 K a year, you know, all that stuff. That is, that is not what it is anymore. Um, it, say you go into a contract to Kabul, Afghanistan now as a PSS, you're going to be making anywhere between 60 and uh, $70,000 a year. Now, mind you, that's tax-free. Um, apart from the local taxes that you have to pay and in Afghanistan, you're paying 13% in taxes. Huh. Yeah, that, they, they're... they're 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 looking at uh, private security companies and, and the American government now like a freaking honeypot. OK, yeah. they're taxing the shit out of us now. Um, so even if you're making that 60 to 70 grand there tax free, you're still having some taken off the top there. 
And some of these companies now are going to make you pay back all that training that you went through with them. No way. And they take that off of your paychecks for the first X amount of months that you're there. Okay. Wow. On top of that, you're, you're lucky if you can make 85 K a year overseas now as a PSS. Again, it kind of depends on the company and the contracts that they have, but that's the norm now. Um, and I, you know, I freaking make that much in, in, in a relative contract stateside. So it's like, you know, what the fuck? Um, obviously I'm getting taxed to shit here just cause you know, thanks Biden, but, <laughs> but uh, you know um, it, it, there really isn't that much discernment between the two anymore. So uh, conventional times you're getting less pay than ever before as an overseas contractor um, stateside contractor pays decent, but I mean, it could be better and yeah. the government doesn't want to pay out as much, especially because of how much in debt we are right now. But Government government's being really, really stingy and less and less money is getting into the frontline workers pockets, you know, with this corporatization structure, they're just, they just want profit, profit, profit. So they're pocketing more and more of the money. And this is leading to a lot of other issues besides declining pay. So what if guys want to get involved with uh, maritime security at all? I know uh, we've had a guy on here who did, I think it was through Blackwater where he was on the cargo ships doing that stuff. Do they still exist? MSO, MSO still exists. Yeah, maritime security companies still exist. Uh, Blackwater, when they were doing maritime security, they were called Z or, you know, XE was the spelling. Um, but they d uh, divided uh, those assets from um, what they are now as Academy with Constellus Group. Um, so, uh, what was Blackwater or Z? They don't do like any maritime stuff anymore, really. There are some other companies within Constellus Group, like Centera Group, that do some maritime stuff. It's mostly like close shoreline patrol yeah. services, like around harbors and marinas and stuff. There are maritime security specific companies, though, like Trident Group, Nexus Group. Uh, those are two American companies. Um, there's like one or two other ones, and then there's a bunch of international ones. Yeah. Um, a lot of British ones actually yeah. that, um, that are doing maritime security. Um, and there's a whole, whole mixed bag of that too, because again, job requirements, what they want from you, um, you need to be a former freaking Navy or Marine Corps kind of guy, yep. you know, for background coast guard, maybe, you know, they, it, the requirements again are increasing more and more and more. Some of the European companies may be a little bit more, uh, 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 loose or open with that kind of thing and what they require. And uh, obviously you do a bunch of up training with them and everything like that, you know? Um, so that industry, yeah, that's still a thing. Um, has declined a little bit because, you know, uh, national navies, you know, actual countries, navies have a, a joint task force uh, operating in the various areas, whether it's the Gulf of Aden or in areas uh, in and around the, uh, the Eastern Indian ocean and South China sea and stuff. Um, around uh, uh, the Horn of uh, Africa and the Horn of South America, you know, things like that. They, there's, there's coalitions of, of countries, navies that are working together now for those services. So maritime security has been scaled back a little bit. It's still, it's still present, you know, um, but they have to do things a little bit differently. And again, the, it's much stricter requirements now and everything like that. Insofar as pay, I, I'm not really sure what the pay is for that. Um, I know it's something like, uh, <clears throat> I, I forget what, I think it was something about like 250 bucks a day or something like that, which is on par for what overseas PSSs and, and, and PSOs are making, you know, on a full-time kind of gig. So it's not differentiating too much from that. So now with that uh, stuff though, it probably wouldn't be tax free, right? Especially as an American citizen. Um, that I don't know, actually, as far as that nuance, because I mean, technically, you'd be operating in international waters a lot of the time. So I would think that it would be tax free. I would ask your, your, your guy that you know about yeah, yeah. that worked in uh, maritime security uh, about that, that that one nuance, I'm not actually sure about as far as uh, how the pay goes with the maritime side of that it could go either way. Cause I know if you're working for the government, it's a little bit different than if you're just working for a private company. Cause even if I go you know, overseas and I'm, I'm just an American citizen, not working for any government, like another company, I'm still liable for all those taxes. I still got to pay yep. all the taxes in the world. So especially yep. with yep. the current administration. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It, apart from the taxes in the country that you're working, um, Iraq, it's like 1.3%, but Afghanistan is like 13%. Um, you still have to file your IRS uh, 2555, you know, uh, foreign income for, or earned income form. Um, and as of this year, up to $108,201 can be written as tax free. Anything past that, um, you have to pay taxes on, which when you're in that pay bracket, you're paying freaking more taxes. So, yeah. um, but not, it's not like you're getting paid that anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> not anymore. So, um, yeah. So. Ever go back to that, you know, old school days. I mean, let's say we get involved in a conflict with who, who knows, right? Well, yeah. China, maybe let's say we need guys. Um, are guys going to be able to go and just go or. You know, I, I, I think especially with a conflict like that or another like big war that breaks out. Yeah. Um, the the need for private security contractors and just just private contractors in general, whether it's HVAC or food service or whatever, you know, that's going to increase. The pay might increase a little bit, but but those requirements for the job, those aren't going to change at this point. Yeah, um, that's 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 set in stone as far as with the government and what they require, though, um, unfortunately. So it's. It's not going to be quite as cowboy esque as it was back in the day, but you might see an increase in pay and uh, some opportunities just in general with that kind of thing. Um, but other than that, no, I don't think so. And I mean, you've got outlier security. Look at what Silver Corps did in fucking Colombia and Venezuela. Um, are you familiar with that at all? No, I'm not. So Silver Corps is a Florida based security contractor. They did some executive protection work. They did some protection during uh, Trump's uh, presidential campaigning back in the day and all that. Uh, it was founded by a uh, uh, former Green Beret. Um, he ended up getting in with uh, this supposed uh, deposed uh, Venezuelan general and uh, a politician from Venezuela. And they were trying to work with uh, this guy in Silver Corps to uh, stage a coup. Hmm. And uh, they went to Colombia and were training some Venezuelan expats and a bunch of Colombians. Like it was like four dudes from Silver Corps, four PSSs from Silver Corps went down to uh, train and advise like 200 something of these guys. And from the get go, they were like, something's not right. And like these guys, they have like little to no equipment. They're freaking starving. The canines they have are near death, like blah, 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 blah. Like it was just not good from the get go. And then, um, lo and behold, um, Venezuelan, uh, uh, Venezuelan counterintelligence specialists have been spying on these meetings and everything between Silver Corps and these guys the entire time. And then some money was, some money was transferred. Silver Corps got a couple million and stuff. And, you know, the, the, these guys wanted them to take all these guys that they were training on these freaking rickety open top little fishing boats that you see going like up and down the Amazon river and shit, like load these guys up on these boats, go land in Venezuela and then just like stage and like take out, like take over the airport, take over like one other strategic location and then go to the Venezuelan presidential palace, kidnap Maduro and fucking get him out of the country into Colombia so that he could be wow. charged or whatever. Everything was just going south from the beginning. They ended up doing a daytime beach landing into Venezuela and like one or two of the boats broke down and they had to turn around and go back. So only half the half the guys got into Venezuela. Two of them were Americans. They were immediately all captured by the Venezuelan military. And then there was this there's this pomp and circumstance show going on for a little while that the American guys were being interrogated like these guys had their passports, their VAID cards. They had all this shit on them and uh, and everything else. And, and it was just it was a shit show. So trying that kind of thing nowadays. And that just happened like a couple, a couple of years ago, um, two, three years ago. You know, I don't think those Americans have still been released from Venezuelan jail yet. Yeah. Trump was trying to get them back, but I don't I don't think they got released. I think they're still stuck in a terrible Venezuelan prison Jeez. being fucking tortured. Um, and those guys are ex-militaries, you know, and fucking they're, you know, brothers and they're fucking stuck there. And there's nothing anybody can do about it because it's Venezuela. Um, so that whole thing went fucking south. Um, so but but that kind of thing, you know, 
if, if a small company tries to go cowboy like that, I mean, something like that's going to happen. And you look at what, what happened with Simon Mann and them, uh, you know, in, uh, in Africa um, and, and the coup uh, there that failed. And, and then they got picked up by uh, uh, Mozambique intelligence uh, agents. And then that the, I, f- I forget which country it was. Uh, Guiana or Guinea. I think it was uh, Guinea, like the island of Guinea, the yeah. Guinea Island or whatever. That's where they were. And then they ended up getting captured. And Simon Mann spent like fucking five years in prison there. Jeez. Um, <clears throat> granted, he's made a, a, a good life for himself now, but <clears throat> that 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 kind of stuff doesn't doesn't fly anymore. You you're not gonna see a mad Mike horror fifth commando kind of situation like you did in the Congo back in the 60s. It, things don't work like that anymore. You, Eric Prince, you know, former founder and owner of Blackwater, he still owns Blackwater Worldwide, which makes firearms and ammunition. He's also a progenitor with uh, Frontier Resource Group and Frontier Services Group, which is a Hong Kong and Dubai-based security company protecting Chinese interests in Africa. So he's still active with that kind of thing, but he's still gotten in a little bit of trouble here and there along the way. I think it'd still be badass to work for him because he is a cowboy in that sense. Um, but at the same time, it's just, it's difficult to do that kind of thing anymore. It just doesn't fly between international law, uh, ICOC, international code of conduct, and then governmental law at at the more localized level, U S law, Congolese law, whatever it is, it's much more difficult to just go and do that kind of thing willy nilly as a small company and just think you're going to have the run of the litter, even though, a government, you know, came to you going, Hey, you know, we need, we need you to do this. Um, you need to be very choosy on the contracts that you're taking. Otherwise that shit, that kind of shit is going to happen. So (laughs) you have to be very careful. Stuff work, man. I mean, for example, with Venezuela, you don't think that the CIA was in there somewhere talking with someone. I mean, it reminds me of the Bay of pigs, you know, back in the day when the, um, (laughs) uh, landing in Cuba happened, it, yeah. You know, very, very uh, James Bond, but at the same point, like, who the fuck was running it? Yeah, no, it, and it was kind of an old school way of doing it. Uh, the CIA actually had really no idea what was going on. Huh. Um, they didn't know until these guys had landed in Venezuela and they wow. were showing up on Venezuelan television. Um, they really didn't know what was going on. The, uh, the Silver Corps guys kept it very hush-hush, and uh, they were expecting the their clients that they were meeting with these deposed supposedly deposed guys which i guess the general somehow has ties to the cartels too um that they were working that they were talking with um between that and the venezuelan counterintelligence program which reaches into colombia you know and and a lot of that northern region of south america um you know it was just a failure from the beginning and and the state department had no idea about it until it was too late Otherwise, they might have been able to supply them a little bit of support yeah. if they found legitimacy in these clients. But I think that was that was initially part of the issue is those guys were already the clients were already made. They were already being they were already being spied on by the Venezuelans. So that it was just it was doomed to fail from the beginning, unfortunately. What if guys do get uh, captured when they are security contractors? There? Do they fall under any type of Geneva Convention or are they on their own? I mean, how much do the bad guys care about the Geneva convention? That's a good point. You know, uh, that, that's a big part of it. You know, um, private security companies, the, 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 these corporate federally contracted private security companies, you know, they're operating, um, with the, uh, the protection enforcement and mandate of U S law, but also like, uh, regulations from the Hague, like, uh, the international code of conduct, which is a set of rules and guidelines and other uh, international convention laws um, that have pretty much banned mercenary work. um, And they'll try you in international court if you're caught as a mercenary. Mm. Um, But for private security companies, there's, uh, they've been very limited in that regard too, internationally on what they can do. Wagner group from Russia is really pushing those boundaries with some of the stuff that they're doing, being involved in, in Libya and then now the central African Republic and a couple other places kudos to them for really pushing those boundaries and really trying to trying to get some work done you know because they are they're they're fighting the extremists just like we are but 
they may not be doing it the most legal way, like what American companies are being forced to do now. So um, there's a lot of those guys, the Russian guys, like former Spetnaz special forces types. Yeah, well, some of them are some of them are currently still in the Russian military too, because um, again, the, the Russian military has a mandatory conscription time period. I, I I can't remember how long it is. I think it's three and a half years or something. But a lot of those guys end up also being in the Russian military at the same time too, and they're like a part advisor, part being employed, deployed, and paid by Wagner Group to some extent. Half the time they say they're you know with a, a Russian reserve unit doing doing advisory work and training and everything. And then half the time they're, you know, they're legitimately with Wagner group. So um, they're definitely keeping it as shadow as they can in this day and age, you know, on, on the, in that aspect. And again, some, some American companies, you know, do that as well, whether it's a, a front or shell company that is directly part of the government, but is, is a, a private company, a shell company, um, you look at the evolution of like GRS and then everything that happened in Benghazi and stuff. Nobody heard about GRS until that shit happened. Mm -hmm. um, and it was like that for other companies too. You know, nobody knew about Blackwater until uh, the Najaf siege happened. And, uh, and then the um, Nisur square shooting happened. Mm -hmm. um, nobody knew, really knew about that company um, until those things happened. One was a good thing. One was a fucking terrible thing. Yeah. Um, partially just sheer bad luck in an accident um you know it, so it, it really is like that you know tr security companies try and be as shadowy as they want to be still in this day and age and there's a couple of good documentaries out there kind of about the earlier times in the 2000s about that like shadow company it's a good documentary but more more and more everything's in public light just because of media and everything else i mean i mean all these all these private security companies have facebook and linkedin accounts they're on youtube and everything you know so it, there's not much of hiding it in that regard anymore, unless you really go out of your way to hide yourself or make yourself covert or you're a shell company for the CIA. Yeah. In that case, you know, they're, they're going to really keep, keep things clamped down until they have to disavow it to some degree or another, or they just dissolve that company. And they've done that with many companies over time. Look at air America back during Vietnam. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's, that's not a new thing. It's just, how it's done has changed. So when I was at uh, Academy doing some training there, it was very strict. You couldn't go anywhere or talk to anybody or do anything. They had me escorted in and out. Um, I, I heard something from one of the guys about, you know, the, the hangers or something like that. I don't really want to go into it, but it's um, I will say that most of the guys that were there were not Americans. Is that something that was being kind of done as far as, I mean, it, it just seems like a weird skirting around a bunch of different laws. Like, are they, they're here as advisors or we're advising them. It, how does that kind of work? So some of that is, well, a lot of private security companies also, also hire expats from other countries and, and foreign personnel. Um, a lot of the food service contractors in Iraq were like Filipino. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, companies like Black, uh, like Academy or what was Blackwater and Academy, they were hiring a lot of uh, uh, Salvadorans for a while. Yeah. Um, uh, and and um, yeah, some Colombians and stuff and some other people like that and and some Ukrainians and some other people. So, I mean, um, apart from a foreign government coming to the company to have them train in the U.S., that's a common thing. I mean, we have foreign, foreign military units come train in the U.S. at military bases mm -hmm. like the Saudis. Um, you know, and then all our coalition training programs, you know, I've trained with the Brits, uh, the French, uh, the Germans here in the United States, you know, so private companies do that thing, do that kind of thing too. You know, if a, if a country comes to them and go, Hey, you know, we want, we want some better training for our guys, you know, they'll, they'll bring them in to train them. Um, sometimes the company will go train, train them at the, at their country, as long as they have the good graces of the American government or whatever. I mean, uh, Academy in particular had gone to Ukraine to train some Ukrainian troops uh, a while back. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's that kind of thing. So it could be, it could be a foreign government's uh, actual military personnel, or it could be expat hires for the company uh, that are going to be working overseas through them. Mm. Um, whether they have citizenship or not in the U S it's hard to tell. That's all in personnel, you know, in HR, it's not really, 
it's not really, uh, you know, something that uh, I would know or, you know, that kind of thing. So, but I mean, I mean, a lot of private security companies have assets in foreign countries, like, like I kind of mentioned before, like with uh, some of the maritime companies that have ships flagged out of Panama. So, you know, it, it just depends on what their assets are and then, you know, who they're friendly with and who they're uh, getting uh, approval and permission from and, and things like that. So. Well, that's quite common in the maritime industry. I mean, a lot of people don't know this, but the U.S. merchant fleet is actually very, very small compared yep. to uh, most nations because we have, you know, the the Paul Jones Act and all of the unions. You, you have to be in the union to get a job on these shipping container ships um, in, in the States. So, and it's very regulated, very strict. So companies just don't want to spend that extra money. They can get around it and flag their vessel and, you know, like you said, Panama or yep. wherever else. Uh, that's what they do quite often. So it doesn't surprise me to hear you say, look, a lot of these PMC companies doing the maritime stuff are flagged outside of the U.S. Yep. Yep. Very much so. You know, and, and I mean, I mean, other assets, too, you know, um, uh, Eric Prince, he has assets in, in, in Africa and in Europe. You know, um, he had and this is one of the things he got in trouble for with uh, Frontier Services Group. They had retrofitted two airplanes with munitions that were going to sell them to the Sudanese government. <laughs> they were retrofitting them in Europe and I guess somebody narked on them and the board of directors for the company was not happy with him. So that he got in a little bit of trouble for that too. But I mean, that kind of thing still happens. Um, so yeah, yeah, it just, yeah, it just depends. And as far as like unions go, you know, cause you know, PSOs, PSSs have unions, uh, merchant Marines have unions, police have unions and all that. It, 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 it's strange to me because like, especially um, the, the, the state I'm in, it's a right to work state. Mm. You know, you don't have to be a part of the union. Um, no matter how much they try and intimidate you or bully you into joining the union, which is pretty fucking shitty. Um, very, very mob tactic of them. Yeah. Still it's one of the last resonant things about unions is, you know, they're one of the last things that the mob ever gave the labor industry um, a, as a whole um, it's just, it, it, the unions just kind of rub me the wrong way in that regards. Like you should not have to be a part of this organization, paying money out of your pocket, yeah. to some fucking fat dude sitting in a fucking trailer somewhere going, Oh yeah, yeah, no, you need to be with us. Otherwise you ain't working, you know, and then throwing a, throwing a seven year old tissy fit, you know, because you want a job. I don't think that's right. I think, I think if, if you have the skills and you have the motivation and everything, um, and, and the background, you, you should be able to get hired yeah. whether you're in a union or not, you know? So I, th I, I think, I think unions are kind of bullshit like that. So, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more with you actually on that, man. Um, DJ, what you're painting kind of a bleak picture for guys out there who want to skirt the U S military and still get training and experience, man. How does, how does a guy get ahead in these times we're living in? Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a very it's become very strict and it's a very, it's very frustrating. It, it, it can be very frustrating. Um, you know, you, you really nowadays, uh, if you don't already have a background and experience working for companies or have this verification of employment for private clients and things like that, um, you know, working with a, a small company or whatever it is, you know, if you don't have that military law enforcement and otherwise experience, it, it is nearly impossible to get into the comp uh, to get into the industry anymore. Yeah. Um, you, yeah, it, it, it is extremely frustrating. So go do two years in the military, preferably like in a military police or a combat arms MOS. Eh, some other ones, you know, certain engineers, things like that. Canine uh, medical, you know, be a medic or a corpsman, whatever, you know, get into those kinds of gigs and you'll be able to get into the industry. No problem. Uh, same with law enforcement, um, you know, and then sometimes if you're an EMT, especially like a tactical EMT or tactical medic um, and, and sometimes firefighters, um, sometimes we get them. Um, so but but those those kinds of those kinds of uh, work work backgrounds are, are, are necessary anymore, unfortunately, for, for security specific contracting. Um, when it comes to other types of contracting, like uh, you know, HVAC work and stuff, you know, you, you have to have your, your whatever tradesman certification and all that stuff. And you're pretty much good to go. You still have to go through all the same security clearance checks and all background checks, all that stuff. But, um, but obviously that applies a little bit differently, you know, security contracting, 
because you have the ability to defend yourself and take lives. It's much under uh, much more of a microscope yeah. than um, in requirements now than, than a lot of the other types of jobs. So it, not to be more bleak, but you know, it, it, it gets better. It gets better, <laughs> especially because of the, the corporatization. And I've been rehashing this a lot, the corporatization of these security companies. Um, yeah. <laughs> it go it goes from the top all the way down <clears throat> to the gear that you're issued. You know, back in the day, those private security companies they 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 were getting top dollar and they were spending top dollar to make sure that their guys had great equipment. That has changed. We're getting more used up and more used up surplus equipment. Um, you're getting cheaper and cheaper uniform issuances and, and components for your uniforms, $5 uncle Mike's holsters, <laughs> you know, uh, um, stuff like that. Uh, for the gig I'm on now, the company, they supply us with the Kevlar soft vest, no plates. I had to buy my own plates. They give you a boot allowance. It's only valued about half the cost of a decent pair of boots. So then you're paying the rest out of pocket, things like that. It, that, is adding up too as far as issues that are happening because the corporatization is happening. The companies are just wanting more and more profit to put it in their pockets and pay the higher ups and less and less equipment and pay and otherwise is getting to your frontline guys. And it's, it's, it's killing morale. It really is. Um, it's less incentive to, you know, work hard or, you know, go that extra mile. It is not incentivizing anyone when you're giving them worse and worse stuff to work with. And more and more, and this goes into the next point, more and more restriction and regulation and policy and um, also a bunch of just useless stuff, a lot of busy work, especially for um, like the lieutenant captain level and all that, even the, even for the contract managers. There's so much like bullshit busy work now and, and paperwork just to make it look like they, they have something to do. Mm. It's, it's, it's shamming. Sham on. It is shamming. Um, definitely, you know, more and more just to give them something to do because a lot of it is really unnecessary and, and is kind of wasteful, but is also taking money out of more people's pockets. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, covered unions, uh, discrepancies and faults with the policy and staff. So, you know, playing into that too, you know, leadership, there's a lot of leadership issues too, and a lot of recruitment issues. Some of these recruiters, you know, again, that corporatization template and what the requirements are, some of these recruiters have no experience in military and all that stuff. The recruiters for these companies for recruiting people, they have no, they, some of them have no experience with this. So then they're just going off of what the company wants and, and they're not being flexible on it at all, which is not good because there needs to be some flexibility, especially when you should have a very diverse range of people with diverse range of skill sets and experience. Um, so that's, that's a big issue. Leadership, you know, uh, the captain level, project manager level, and then higher up from there, <laughs> they're doing a lot of useless stuff or they're just not doing anything. You yeah. know, um, there are some very lazy people in leadership positions uh, in the company that I'm in that I've seen and I know other people I've talked to in other companies, and you can see reviews on Glassdoor, um, plenty of those. Um, the, the issues with the higher ups and upper supervisors and all that, not, not helping you at all. Mm. And communication is difficult or non-existent practically um, between, between that. You know, you have to go through all these hoops, some internal company reporting thing or, you know, whatever it is. You know, it's cool. I'm able to email back and forth with my immediate lieutenant very easily. Getting a hold of my captain, fucking near impossible unless something kind of, kind of bad, bad is kind of a bad word, but you know, it's some something negative maybe going on. Then you'll hear from them, <laughs> but other than that, you ain't hearing anything from them ever. And then they go and they work with the project manager and the acquisitions people and get you the worst fucking equipment that they can or the cheapest equipment that they can. So the company pockets more money and you don't get any. Um, so those, those are some big issues with, with leadership that I've seen and that other people have seen. And you can go see these reviews like on Glassdoor and stuff. Um, other than that, I mean, I like my, my lieutenant is fucking awesome. I love him. Um, 
he's great, you know, and, and, and I'll, I'll, there is leadership out there and supervisors out there that have been in your shoes being, being a frontline PSO and PSS that, that get it. And they're going to be on point. It's just like having a squared away sergeant in your fucking squad in the military. You know, if, if they're seasoned, they get it. They've been where you are. You know, they're not just, they're not some stick up their ass kind of dude. And they lead them from the front. That's the kind of people that we want and we need. Um, but you're starting to see kind of less and less of that, whether they're disincentivized or they're just, they're just not, they just don't have the experience or the, the smarts to be in those positions. Um, so that's, that's creating some issues too, among all these other things. Again, some great people in the industry, as far as that goes. And then some, some people that should be fucking retired, um, you know, uh, that, that is part of the issue. And some of the issues, you know, um, some of the, some of the, my contract, some of the, uh, guys that they're hiring, they're retired law enforcement that are in their fucking sixties. Wow. They're not spring chickens. Okay. I, I love those guys to death, but the moment, any relative moment when any somewhat fit young dude fucking jumps them and starts pounding them, what's going to happen? It's, it's not going to go in, in the, the older gentleman or lady PSOs, PSS's favor. It's not going to work well for them. They're not as strong anymore. They're not as fast. Un- unfortunately, that's a systemic, at least with the domestic contracting side that I've seen, uh, that is an issue as well. Again, not harping, not harping on the old salt. I love those guys. But um, there should be a requirement there at least, you know, if if – they need to increase the uh, training requirement standard too. Yeah. Um, as far as that goes, there needs to be a little bit more there as far as that goes. But other than that, I mean, that that's all cool. It's just, that's sometimes it makes me raise an eyebrow because like, so half these guys are damn near falling asleep in our training classes. And it's like, dude, <laughs> what, what what's happening when you're on site? Come on. Well, this has um, been a, this has been a topic that I've covered extensively with Robin from secure mindset. He's in the Netherlands. He's a security professional out there, and he's always been saying the same thing is we we need to raise the bar. There needs to be some sort of fitness standard, some sort of something as far as security professionals go. Um, and especially when you're doing it, you know, like you guys are, uh, you know, armed and, and on government contracts, it's even more necessary. So the fact that they don't do that is kind of mind blowing. There, There is a very basic medical, medically related uh, physical fitness requirement that you have to meet, but that test is only done every five years. Mm-hmm. A lot can happen in five years. <laughs> so, um, and, and so the, the physical fitness standard is, is very low when it comes to that kind of thing. It's a little, it's a little bit more frequently for the overseas PSS guys. I think it's like every, every year and a half, every two years. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a little bit more frequent, but it's still a lot can happen in that time. You know, and, and when you're overseas, you need to maintain a, a certain fitness level. Um, they do have a certain fitness requirement for that. It is, the State Department does anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, so apart from that, you know, then you've got your your training requirements with with firearms and everything. And that's done every X amount of months. And that's uh, an agency. Agency template, agency framework, shooting standard. Um there's not much dynamic movement from that. You're just kind of increasing the distance and the stages that you shoot and you eventually do a little bit of kneeling and some barrier shooting, but you're not really dynamically moving at all or anything like that. So that's an issue. PSSs are a little bit different for the overseas stuff. They're up trained a little bit more on that, you know, but being paramilitary, I could do all that shit anyway. And then with, with prior executive protection, I was doing a lot of that anyway. Um, with PSO stuff, they don't really do that. Um, it's, it's the, just the, the, the basic federal, uh, shooting standard requirement, whatever test it is. Um, there's a couple of different tests that are done. Um, PSS is a little bit different, but at the same time, once you do, once you're done with that initial training and stuff, it's just a rifle and uh, weapons platform qualification every X amount of months. And that's it. Mm. That's all it is. You might have the opportunity to kind of train a little bit more often in that regard, but it, it, that it's still the same. You have a basic firearm requirement that you have to meet with uh, qualifications, requalification, and that's it. Um, so those are those are some things there. Um, 
Yeah. Speaking about training, DJ, um, now you mentioned, you know, ESI, companies like that. And I've actually trained with ESI a little bit myself. And I would never say anything bad about them. However, with that being said, they're, it's a good company. It did seem a little bit, it was a lot and it was a lot of money. Um, if you want to do the whole program, it's going to run you, unless you have a GI bill, it's going to personally cost you a, a small fortune, to be honest, to take the whole pipe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is it worth it, man? I mean, like you said, some of you know, ESI, I know, has companies like Gavin DeBecker and, and some of those guys that they kind of work with. But is it really worth it? Yeah, it, again, it, it, e, it depends. Um, if, if the company that you want to train with is directly has direct networking and connection to security companies that you can apply to or that they help you apply to. CRI has a three or four security companies that they work with, you know, being ex Israeli that, you know, they have some connections there. Um, ESI does have some connections, Gavin DeBecker, Sally Port. Um, There's a couple of other executive protection specific companies that recognize ESI certificates um, that will hire you on, but you're only going to be making like 15 bucks an hour. Um, with some of those companies. So some will recognize those certificates, but um, a lot of those outside training companies for that kind of stuff, your, your PSD bodyguard, executive protection and all that. Honestly, no, it's not really worth it unless they have that direct connection where you can get, you can go right into a job after basically. I can't tell you how many guys I've trained with, man. And I've run the gamut as far as these schools have gone um, yeah. that I've, I've talked to a year, two years later, they're still not in, having any work yeah it's yeah. it's concerning frankly because you sat there not only did you spend the money you gave a lot of blood sweat and tears to it as well and yeah you're sitting around without work man yeah and 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 a lot of those training companies are great training companies like you yeah. said you know um they do good work but yeah. the the private security companies don't really recognize those certificates because they want work experience yeah. that's what they want they want work yeah. experience it's getting your foot in the door. That's the, that's yep. the hard part. It is. It is. And that's why, that's why, unfortunately, nowadays you got to go to the military or uh, be a cop for a couple of years or be a federal agent for a couple of years or whatever, you know, um, that's, that's, those are the, one of the biggest things that have changed. You can't be a, you can't just be a bouncer and get a job toting a, toting an M4 <laughs> rolling around in an up armored escalator anymore. You can't do that anymore. Sometimes I feel like it would be better if they just hired bouncers, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, if it was a very uptrained bouncer, yeah, definitely. If you went through ESI and stuff, yeah, yeah, sure, why not? And that's and and again, that's one of those things I don't really agree with, uh, uh, with how the private sector and its corporatization has been going. Uh, I understand the federal government's getting more and more picky, and they're wanting more and more requirements and 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 restrictions and everything else. You know, that's one thing, but. The companies should still, there should still be an element for the companies to be a little bit more um, understanding and accepting of people that do want to get their foot in the door yeah. um, a little more easily. Um, obviously, a little bit of training experience is going to go a long way, but I mean, it's it's so different from what it used to be. So you just have to have that background now. You yeah. have to. Well, I wish it wasn't the case, man, because, you know, you've got a lot of solid dudes out there that, that want to get in here, but yeah. it's it's the way it is, and you can't really do anything about it. For So for all the young guys out there, listen to what DJ's telling you guys, go sign up, join the Army, join the whatever, Marine Corps, whatever it is. Um, probably not the Air Force or Navy so much, right? Uh, well, I mean, the Air Force, you have security forces, and then you have their special operations. Uh Navy, Navy has special operations stuff, you know, um, uh, my buddy who runs, uh, Gray Fox investigations, LLC out of Florida, he was in the Navy. He was in a mine, mine, special pro, uh, special warfare program. Mm -hmm. I want to say he was involved with the SWIC teams a little bit too. Um, but he did some cool shit in the Navy and then he, he actually went and trained with Blackwater back in the day. Um, and then he started his own private investigation firm. So, um, and that's another good way to do it, to get your foot in the door is get, get your state certifications and go work for one of these uh, private investigation companies yeah. or work for uh, a more local private security company and get some years in there because that's going to look good on your resume yeah. um, to get your foot in the door to these larger 
federally contracted private security companies, you know, you, you got to rack up that experience, but you have to start somewhere. So um, in, in this day and age, so there's still a way to get in a couple of different ways. It's just, it takes more time and yeah. uh, it's, it's just, it's, they just require more of you now. So um, there's still opportunity there. Um, albeit issues with pay and everything else, but, uh, but I mean, there's still opportunity there. So, you know, and, uh, what else can I say about that? Um, save as much fucking money as you can. <laughs> just save That's your money. Advice, no matter what you're doing. Maybe, yeah, yeah, exactly. Just save your money. You know, um, even before getting with one of these companies, save as much money as you can. Um, because especially with uh, even even for the federal contracted PSO stateside, you still have to pay for your own security license, your firearms, your state firearms license, um, and anything else federally that they require of you and stuff as far as licensure. Some some of it the company may cover, but at the state level, you're paying that all out of your own pocket. Um, so you need to be able to do that. You're probably going to end up buying some of your own fucking gear and equipment. So put some money aside for that too. I buy my own tourniquets. I buy my own flashlights and everything. You know, I had to buy plates for my vest. Those are things you got to take into consideration too. Um, the pants that I was issued, the uniform pants that we were issued, they're garbage. So I bought pants that were within the uh, approved requirement framework, and I just wear those pants. But I bought them myself. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of that stuff that you have to take into consideration. So save your money. Cause you're going to be spending it yeah. <laughs> some yeah. way or another. So hey, the same thing on the fire department, to be honest, I mean, guys will buy their own stream light, light guys will buy their own, you know, uniform station pants. It, same thing, man, what they give you is shit. And if you want better shit or you want more shit, you got to buy it yourself. So yep. save your fucking money. Exactly. Exactly. You know, well, listen, man, I appreciate you coming on here, bro. It's been a pleasure talking with you again. I'm glad that you could finally like shed some light on this for us in an honest way, because you got a lot of guys out there making these like cool videos of them sitting on a mountaintop talking about how you can get into the private security contractor. It's not as hard as you think. No, it's hard, guys, unless you listen to DJ, join the military, you know, and if you don't want to join the military, OK, but like. Go to police academy, you know, do something. And then that will, I think, aid you later on in, in becoming um, one of the cool guys with the AR and some plate carriers and some Oakleys. So, yeah, yeah, that's that's absolutely it. And, and I mean, um, I, I think that was I think that was kind of pointing out Kit Badger a little bit. He's a good dude. Um, Ivan's a good dude. He's been out of the contracting game for a while now, though. And, and again, things have changed drastically since he he got out and he did weigh out the pros and cons very well in that video. I think you're talking about. Um, Actually, yeah. Well, I should clarify there. It was an amazing video. I love that video. <laughs> yeah, it is good. Um, but with it, that being said, um, God damn, the view is great. <laughs> no, it's a fucking, he did a good job with that. I got to take a few notes from his book there, but um, yeah, yeah, it's for, for sure though. It's the type of thing where you want to have all the information before you do it. And especially look before you waste your money going through, I mean, it's not going to be a waste of money to go through some of these HRCC courses or whatever, because you'll learn some good skills, uh, but it's not going to necessarily translate into work. So exactly, exactly. And uh, I, I just wanted to mention two other things. Um, there are two YouTube channels and, and they have correlating websites or whatever. One is the Overseas Contractor Academy, Contractor Ken. Um, he puts out some amazing content and he's got packets together on the Overseas Contractor Academy website to help you understand about how you can get into these uh, uh, the private contracting industry um, uh, at, at the federal, the federal and defense level and everything. So overseas contractor Academy is amazing. And then uh, this guy uh, uh, is either Ken or Kevin talked to him a while back. He has a YouTube channel called vets to PSC uh, more directed towards veterans trying to get into private security contracting, but it applies to anyone. He, he's got some videos on his, on his YouTube channel that just show you, how to apply on these companies' websites. That's, mm -hmm. that's a lot of what he does. He, he's working for a private contractor right now. I'm not going to say who, um, but um, he, he just shows you, you know, companies that are out there and how to apply to them um, step by step on their, on their websites and everything. So he shows you how to do that. And he gives some good information too. <clears throat> Again, he's in the game right now too. So um, he gives some good information out there, but I haven't really seen anything like uh, this podcast that we're doing right now that covers the immediate current climate for private security contracting 
and the changes that are happening. Um, so a lot more of this needs to happen for sure. Um, might be able to talk more about this in the future, uh, pending some geopolitical things that happen and things like that, you know? So, um, other than that, I look forward to making some more, uh, GFS, uh, content, uh, for the channel and for the website and blogs and stuff. And I know we have a, there's another video that should be coming out soon for, uh, Gutterfying Secrets. Yeah, you just uh, did a great, uh, video about close in shooting yep. position two, how to, um, Really take care of business when a guy's a little bit too close to you with an unfriendly edged weapon. So <laughs> yep. that's going to be cool. That's going to be dropped in the next couple of days. So thank you for that, DJ. I know you're heading up our firearms training. So that's something that's really uh, that's something that's really lacking on the channel. And I've gotten messages before. Hey, Will, why don't you do more about cool guy shooting? Well, I'd be glad to, but you know, I'm loving behind. Uh, <laughs> let's just say. I'm in a state that you can't go and shoot at open ranges and stuff. So it's more difficult for me than it's worth. I'd have to hire a freaking private day at the range. I'm not spending the money on YouTube. DJ, you've been shooting since, you know, since I was walking around uh, on ships and stuff. So you're a lot more with it than me. So that's why you're heading up our uh, firearms training here and all of that. Not to mention the fact that you're going to be coming down uh, New York city, August 28th, 29th, freaking hell. Yeah. You're going to be doing a, uh, a guest speaker position at our seminar teaching about some bodyguard tactics and really, really cool edge weapon defense. So we're stoked about that. And then I know in um, September, October, we're going to be doing another seminar together. So I'm looking forward to both of those as well. It's going to be sick, man. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. I, I got to start uh, writing up the curriculum for the uh, executive protection stuff for the uh, August seminar coming up. Um, yeah. I I'm looking forward to coming out, man. It's going to be awesome. Uh, looking forward to, uh, you know, getting slapped around a little bit, thrown around a little bit, you know. <laughs> we need big guys out here, man. I can't be going out of bed all the time. It doesn't look right, dude. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, no. Yeah, it, it'll be a good time. It'll be a good time, you know. And and, and then, yeah, I'll work alongside you with, like, the uh, edge weapon stuff. And, um, yeah, yeah. So, I, I have I, – I'm afforded uh, – uh, I'm in a, a little bit more pro-gun state, so – I'm able to uh, go to the range a little bit. Well, when I'm able to, when I'm not working, uh, go to the range and do some, be able to make some content for uh, firearm related stuff. So um, definitely people go to the gutter fighting secrets uh, uh, website or, you know, comment on this video when it goes up, um, go to the gutters fighting secrets website, hit me up. Cause I'm on there. Um, ask, you know, let us know what you want to see as far as uh, uh, firearm related content for gutter fighting secrets uh, is concerned and uh, I'll try and make it happen as best as I can. So right on. Yeah, absolutely. Guys comment down below. Let us know what you want. If you like more videos about how to get into, you know, security contracting, if you want DJ's advice about getting in the army, I know there's a lot of, there's a lot to it. Uh, sometimes as far as talking to your recruiter, what do you have questions about this and that DJ can answer all that stuff for you way, way better than I ever could. Uh, not to mention the fact guys, gutterfightingsecrets.com. Great resource for you. DJ's been writing some more uh, blogs for us. He did a great one about uh, knife fighting. Prior to that, he did a great one about, you know, sighting in your rifle and stuff like that. So really good stuff. And uh, not to mention the fact that if you want to sign up for this seminar, there are still spaces left, guys. I'm limiting it. 12 students, okay? We still have space. Get in touch with me. Comment down below, gutterfightingsecrets at gmail.com. This week, the uh, landing page for the website registration is up. But if you get to me before that landing page goes up, you will get a significant discount for the tuition of this seminar. So within a week, that's a special offer is going to go away. But if you DM me now, guys, I'll give you the uh, I will still give you the um, military active military or law enforcement discount just because you got in touch with me one on one. But again, that's going away at the end of this week when that landing page goes up. Full price is going to be full price unless you can show me an active military ID or law enforcement or fire or something like that. So, DJ, man, I'm stoked. I'm getting stoked about the seminar, but I'm certainly stoked that we were able to freaking do this video and shed some light on this stuff for these guys because, you know, the, the questions I get, man, it's always the same thing. And I'm always saying I wish I had someone to just break it down in an honest way for these guys. So thank you for that. Hell yeah, man. Hell yeah. Right, yeah. I'm glad we did this too. Cause it's, 
it is it has become very interesting as far as private security industry goes right now. So, um, and I, I obviously keep a close eye on it because I still work at it right now, but um, just just otherwise too, and and in the geopolitical spectrum and everything else. So, um, yeah, we'll we'll definitely be doing more of these. And uh, again, yeah, just uh, freaking hit me up if you got questions uh, on my YouTube channel. Uh, when this video goes up on the gutter fighting secrets specific website and i'll try and answer any questions that you have and uh we'll get more content out to you guys so fuck yeah right, right on dj you're going to be getting a gutter fighting secrets email very soon which will be in the links below for these podcasts but before that um just comment down below if you want to get in touch with dj and i'll hook you guys up uh but you know you're gonna to have to go through me for now to get in touch with dj so we don't want to uh we don't want to mess with any of dj's uh you know, special specialness. I'll just leave it at that. Oh, <laughs> shut up, Will. I'm sick. I'm sick, yeah, bitches. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Until next time, please remember that you are your first and last line of defense. And DJ and I will see you very soon. And hopefully, if you're not a pussy, we'll see you at the seminar. Don't be All scared. Right, guys. <laughs> we gotta go. We'll, uh... Don't be scared. Be prepared. <laughs>